Crossroads Media. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Sports Talk with Broads. What a weekend for your Sixers. Friday night, Joel Embiid hits a spinorama, step back J, falls to the ground, and wins the basketball game with one second to go. That was beautiful. That was fantastic. That was your team facing adversity, being down in that ball game. But how much did I stress that when you go on a road trip, a very hectic road trip, with a lot of trauma on the body, you come home, it's difficult. I don't know why. I don't have the answer for you, but it's not easy. And you saw the Sixers fell in the trap. But when they needed it, Joel Embiid was there. Tyrese Maxey defensively was getting all the praise. It was a big-time W for your squad. And on Sunday, I label that the Sunday scary. It's a weird day. It was sort of a game where you just go through the motions. But Joel, in 31 minutes... Gives you 34 points. He had four blocks. He had a steal. He was all over the place. But you beat him down so bad that Deadman, Furkan, and even Springer got some action. You handled business the way you needed to. So this team just thrives right now. And it's led by Joel and James Harden. Those two at the top of the damn league when it comes to assists for your primary ball handler. And with Joel scoring the basketball from the nail, that mid-range J, it's all beauty, man. It's all beauty. They just keep humming. This is the best we've seen this organization under Joel Embiid. And surprise, surprise, James Harden is the reason why that's the case. So for all those fools that despise Daryl Morey for adding a an older guy for adding a player with a resume that, oh, I'm so scared. You shouldn't be. You shouldn't be scared of adding this type of weapon to your team because you see what happens when he returns to a season fully healthy. You see what happens when someone so intelligent with the ball in his hands gets an opportunity to play a full season with the big fella. It's not. As simple as you get traded at the deadline. Keep in mind, you're not even fully yourself because your hamstring was hindering you. And then please go save us. Please go make it all happen in the postseason. It doesn't happen like that. Now you get an opportunity to settle things down, to play a full season together. And those two are the best two in the game. (laughs) <laughs> like, to, uh, excuse me, not Tobias. We'll get to Tobias. He was minus 25 in 14 minutes in the first half against Portland. He's in a bit of a funk. But we also know that him and P.J. Tucker left that basketball game against Milwaukee when they had the explosive W. Is he right right now? And is there enough time for him to either get healthy or figure out how he's going to play with whatever he's dealing with right now. I listened to some sports talk radio over the weekend. I got up nice and early on Saturday and Sunday, went around, got myself some coffee, had some errands to run, and I heard some callers call into the Fanatic, and they were a little disappointed with Tobias, and they want to send him to the bench and all that stuff. I think Tobias is going to be crucial for you. P.J. Tucker had zero points against Washington, but you also saw him make impact plays to start the puppy off. Tobias last season defensively was a crucial part to your success. Don't sleep on Tobias, even though it's not all glorious. I think I'm very confident in the fact that we'll be talking about a lot more positives that Tobias brings to the table when we talk about the important games compared to the negatives. There might be some things sprinkled in that I'm not necessarily in love with. But overall, I think we'll look at more pros than cons. So anyway, where I was going there there with James Harden, he had 14 assists in the game against Washington. The dude just sets everybody up perfectly. He knows and understands the game of basketball like no other. 
And when the guy who has the rock in his hands sees it as well as he sees it, you're going to be in position and your teammates are going to have shots. Then it comes down to, will they deliver? Will Tyrese Maxey make his threes? Will Tobias make his threes? Will George Niang make those shots? That's to be determined. But I do know for a fact that James Harden thrives getting his teammates those type of looks. And that's step one. But it's incredible to see the game the way he plays it or to watch the game the way he sees it. I don't even know if that makes sense. I'm just in love with the way this team is operating right now. And it all stems from that two-man game and then beat at the nail. It's crazy what he's doing with that mid-range jumper. And I forget who it was exactly. I don't know the name of the individual, but there was someone who put out this highlight package on Twitter that went a little bit crazy. And you could see all the greats in this game. Kobe Bryant and the rest of them. It, it, it was insane. Joel replicating every single one of them. The best to ever play. Whether they're guards, whether they're small forwards, whether they're power forwards, you name it. I believe was Mello in there, was KD in there. My mind might be lost on exactly who the players were, but they're all-time greats, and it's him just duplicating what they do. Oh, by the way, he's a (laughs) seven-footer. It doesn't add up. I remember a few years back, he told the world that he was watching tape on guards. He was watching tape on the best, no matter what the position was. And that got a lot of Sixers fans upset. I'll never forget it. Why? Why is he watching what they're doing? They shouldn't be, they shouldn't be the same player. Sorry. This is greatness. And he does it at every single level on the offensive side, plus defensively. Because Friday night, he had three blocks and two steals as well in his 38 minutes where he had 39 points. I've never seen such a dominant player. So consistent. It's nonstop. It's every night. I don't even remember the last time he had a bad game. And even if he did, quote, have a bad game, you look at the box score and you still see 32, 7, and 7 with the steal and two blocks. Those are his bad games. Those are the times where you want a little bit more from him. Ooh, only 32, 7, and 7. Mm. He probably left 42 out on the floor. Probably could have had about 10 more points, 8 more points. Ah, but don't worry about it. They got the W anyway. This team is sharp. And they're becoming cohesive at the right time. So it's it's nice to see Melton get going Sunday. I keep saying Sunday, which is really today. But if you're listening to this as the Monday morning pod, I'm trying to put it all together here. But I'm also just confusing myself and making it more difficult for me. Melton had three threes with 10 points. But McDaniels with the injury... That's no good because he does give you this element, as I alluded to before, that not anyone else on the team has. Like, he does something different than every player. Sometimes there's something you can get by with because there's another player who might have a lesser talent but a similar role. Let's say there's a three-point specialist that goes down and you have a three-point specialist on your bench. You could slide that person in and still have, like, similar structure. Well, I think Jalen McDaniels gives you something that you don't really have with the length and the size in that position. Now, I was waiting after the game to get an update from him, from Doc, and, and it looks like, and I'll, and I'll kind of give you the, the actual full quote just so we're on the same page here, but something along the lines of they escaped one. Thought it was going to be worse. Doc Rivers says he doesn't believe that McDaniels hip Injury is serious. I really hope not. Who's the one that I thought I saw the 
the quote with a little more beef to it. Um, that was a scary bump, but it looks like he'll be okay. They don't think it's going to be serious. So I can't be. Can't be because you need him. You need him. You know what else happened over the weekend? Matisse Thibel and that nonsense happened. Now, I have no idea where Matisse Thibel thinks he gets off, okay? But he pissed me off. The fact that he said it's hard when on a talented team and when you're demanded to win, it's hard to showcase himself. Now it feels like he has the opportunity to showcase who he is. Matisse Thibel, you started for the Sixers. Like, there were times where you legitimately started and was in the starting rotation. I don't know what more you could ask for out of a franchise that's competing for a championship. Like, they valued what you did so much defensively, and they lacked in so many other areas that there were times where they counted on you to be the guy to help stop players on the defensive end. That's your bread and butter. That's what you're supposed to do. So, stop it. Stop saying you didn't have a chance. You had plenty of chances to be out there on the floor. And if you say, well, I was so focused on the defensive end, I couldn't flourish on the offensive end. You you didn't flourish on the offensive end because you're not good offensively. And that's on you to improve and get better. And Pete has gotten better every single offseason. And even when you think he can't get any more better, he does. Like, oh, I don't know how he can improve in that area. He does. He just becomes more efficient, more lethal. Footwork gets better. You think it's out of 10. It is out of 10. It gets to an 11. James Harden over the years. Think about where he is passing the basketball now compared to where he once was in his career. Putting the ball in his hands, he has become something super special. The fact that Matisse thinks that there wasn't a chance for him to grow and blossom here, he had every chance. Because just like I mentioned with Jalen McDaniels, to a different level, but it's very similar. At that point over the years, Matisse Theibel gave this team something they didn't have, a defensive element. Therefore, if you could just produce a little bit more offensively, if you gave them a little bit something, you would have stayed. You would have been something unreal, a 3 and D guy that this team desperately needs. And desperately has been looking for. We've been hungry for that. You have you were given years and years and years to be that guy. And then you chose to not be there for your team in Toronto. You chose that. That was a chance for you to play against Toronto in a big spot that you decided not to be there for your team. Matisse, there's no one to look at but yourself. Look at Mikel Bridges. Now, he always had a way more impressive upside than Theibel. My point is, you have every chance when you step on that floor for NBA games, night after night after night, plenty of chances to be a better player. Don't put the blame on anybody but yourself. Don't say it's hard because we demand a win. That's what this league is. That's what the NBA is about. The NBA is about winning championships. If you're there for the right reasons, let's go to some of Thibault's stats. Just year after year, 25 minutes a night, he played in the 2021-22 season. 20 minutes a night. He played in the 2021 season. By the way, he started 50 out of 66 games a couple years ago. Then it slipped a little bit to 15 minutes, but that's all because you weren't doing your job. 20 to 25 minutes a night. 20 to 25 minutes a night his first three seasons here in Philadelphia. His rookie year played 20 minutes a night. That pisses me off. So I get it. This should be more about praising who this team has become and how they've really rallied. And I think they've become a group, like a strong, strong group that they feel established right now. I know that there are some fans upset that they have to come back from behind. 
I know there is. I hear them every day. Well, why does it take them until the second half? Why do they lose a lead after they get one? They're winning games, man. It's not easy in this league. So I actually give them credit. And you could even see, I I saw, I want to pull this back up. Because it was one of those ESPN stats and information. And I knew I should have screenshotted it, but I didn't. And now there's all these other tweets going up. So I want to get to this, but it's a lot about what they did. The 76ers trailed by 10 points with five minutes to go in the fourth quarter and beat the Portland Trailblazers. Entering Friday, they lost 80 straight games when trailing by double digits in the final five minutes of regulation. Prior to last night, their last win in this type of situation was against the Nets in 2018 on November 25th. I don't go, wow, I can't believe they were down that much. I go, hold on a second. Five minutes ago? Down 10? Double digits. Down five. We bitch and complain every moment when they're on the other end of this. So when they're the team to do it, we have to acknowledge that that's impressive. That's not easy. Especially when, let's be honest, They didn't play the best game to that point. But here's your positive. When you get to that point, it's the fourth quarter. It's the end of the game. Your stars stepped up. Your stars delivered. Biggest moments. They were there. I don't know how that's not what the takeaway is. Here's more. Joel Embiid hit a go-ahead field goal with 1.5 seconds left, marking it his latest go-ahead field goal of his career. It also marked his fifth consecutive 30-point game, longest active streak in the NBA. That was after Friday, of course, they played today. What was the – how much time was left against Toronto? Toronto game three. I'm watching it here. This was, excuse me, I just burp on the microphone? Oh, my Lord. Did you pick that up? Talk about unprofessional. Oh, because that was in overtime. I was going to say, I remember that being less than 1.5 seconds. There was 0.7 left on the clock. Look at Danny Green celebrating. I'm watching this on my phone right now. If you're listening to this on the podcast version. By the way, make sure you check out Sports Talk with Broads on the pod. Apple Pod, Spotify. So anyway, yeah, it says hit the go-ahead field goal with 1.5 seconds left, making it the latest go-ahead field goal of his career. The go Is it because the game was tied against Toronto when the shot was made? Because it was 101-101? But isn't that still a go-ahead bucket? I don't know. Maybe they got it wrong. Maybe I'm reading the technicality wrong. I told you, my brain is a bunch of mush, so I apologize. All right, with that said, let's hear from you all. Let's do that. Let's take your calls right now, and we'll we'll see how you feel because after the buzzer beater or the, the game-winning shot, I should say, the Anytime Hotline reacted. So here we go. Are you fucking kidding me? Holy fuck. Fuck me. I don't know what the fuck he's doing, but he said, fuck this, I got this. MVP. He should be the MVP. Now, we we know that every night the Jokic fans are tweeting out the Jokic stuff. The Embiid fans are tweeting out the Embiid stuff. I don't know. For a long period of time, I was in the mindset of he's never going to get it. I'm starting to wonder, is he doing enough now to reopen that door? And it's being recognized because of how consistent it is. And how miraculous it is. And, you know, it it really is super special what he's doing. Maybe it is becoming more of a mainstream topic that Embiid should have a shot. He's my MVP. I'm trying to now, this is just like the Broads checks his phone show. Maybe that should be the title of this one. Because now here I am going back to the phone and, seeing if there is an updated odds. That's normally how you get your get your info on what they're thinking. If you go to Futures and you go to the MVP winner, Embiid is plus 250 and Jokic is minus 400. 
that minus 400 is still telling me that it's a super long shot. And I'm not surprised by that. I just claim that it might be opening up the door again. Well, opening up the door is technically a long shot, so it still kind of fits what I thought. But, you know, it would have to be lower than the minus 400. We got to be getting to the minus 200. If we start to see that continuing to get closer to a minus 300, a minus 250, something like that, then maybe I'm like, hold on, maybe B can sneak in there. But for right now, apparently the greatest basketball player to ever touch the hardwood in Jokic, which is just asinine to me, is going to go for his third straight. It's, it's, it's irritating. Those Sixers, man. I'm a doofus, and I fell asleep, and I only got to see, like, the last half of the fourth quarter. But, God damn, man. Like, how does anybody say talk trash on Embiid? The man is a hero. Was there any doubt in your heart when that ball hit his hands that he was going to put it in the net? No. I had no fear at all that he was going to get it done, and he did. He is a superstar, man. This team is incredible. Love it. Hey, I'm with you. I'm with you. I, I, I was trying to say this for the whole season. Wait. Wait and let them gel. Wait and let them groove. Remember when they were 12 and 12? That's James terrible. Now, you know what you're seeing? You're seeing a group that needed some time to get healthy. Maxi and Harden get back on the floor and just learn how to play with one another. They needed to figure some things out. If you want to tell me that their guard play defensively scares you, that's a hole. That's a hole. We're praising Maxi this weekend for his defense against Portland, but traditionally, it's a struggle. They can get exposed there. But Joel Embiid, his presence changes a lot. How many times have you watched someone go up for a jump shot? Here's Joel in their face, and then they have to pass the basketball back out to the perimeter and reset. My favorite is you watch someone, probably a guard, let's say, penetrate, and now they're in the paint, but Embiid is there. And you watch them where they would normally go for a layup. His presence is so massive, and he's so fearful. He's, he's, he's so fearful or you, you should be fearful of him. His presence is so demanding and it's toxic that instead of going up for a layup because you know it's going to get swatted or pinned against the backboard, that they continue to drive the paint and they continue to maybe drive baseline and they reset. They'll go from dribble penetration from one corner, thinking they have a nice easy layup off the glass. Oh, no, I don't. They continue to drive across the baseline to the other corner, and then they swing it back around and reset. That should be an easy two. But here's a seven-foot individual he's, who's meeting you at the rim. So if you do get beat with some of your guard play, you have the best center to ever play the sport of basketball right there in the paint right now. So, sure, there's a deficiency, but then you have one of the biggest positives. And I've heard multiple people now talk about how much of a star he is. You win in this league when your stars are doing this. This is why I always stress, when you have superstars, things look different. Well, Embiid's playing the highest level of basketball that we've ever seen which is just nuts because of how good he has been for years now. But it's the every night factor. It really is. Let's go to Ethan. What's going on, bro? It's Joel Embiid. He's so clutch. He is him. Mike Joel Jordan. Give him a Jordan brand sneaker. I know he's under armor, but switch him over to Jordan brand. What a win by the Sixers. Another come-from-behind win. I would like to see less of those, but, hey, you'll take the win. We're one game back in the loss column against Boston. Just huge. We need that home court. If we can get it, that would be awesome. Anyways, Joel Embiid is him. So, Ethan is one that doesn't like the fact that they have to come back from behind all the time. 
I would love for the team to just start out and score 45 points in the first quarter every night. I also know that it's the NBA regular season. You're on a big road trip. You come home. It's your first game back. There's weirdness to that. That's something that is into the equation. There's so much time in a game where let's say I'll just, I'll use Portland as the example, but let's say Portland scores 34 in the first quarter and the Sixers score 28. So they're down six after the first quarter. That doesn't bother me that much. And it goes back to the flow of runs that I always go, that I, that I always talk about. That's technically being down after the first quarter. Oh, they didn't come out hot. The other team scored 34. Let's say it's 36 to 28. They're down eight. There's just so much time and so much basketball left that because a team scored 38 or scored 39 in the first quarter and they start out super hot. Well, traditionally, if this team isn't a great three-point shooting team and they shot the ball very well, Miami's the perfect example. Miami came into Philadelphia after that Boston loss and they ended up knocking down all these threes. Well, they weren't going to keep that up forever. The Sixers play Miami in the next game down in Miami and the shooting looked different because they're not that type of team and things even out. So at that point, the Sixers won one, Miami won one. Miami won one where they shot the lights out, but Miami's not normally that type of team. And even now, then the Sixers got one. It's the same thing with quarters. If one team shoots the light out in the first quarter and the Sixers are down nine, well, wait until the third quarter, mid-third quarter, when they're no longer shooting 57% from three and it dips back down to what they are or who they are. There's always going to be nights. I, I I remember when they played Milwaukee on Christmas Day, and I think it was the Josh Richardson year, the Al Horford year, the year where we thought the team could probably be a lot better than they were, but it was clunky. They could never find themselves. They shot 5 billion percent from three against Milwaukee, and they had a big win on Christmas Day. Those type of things happen, but it's not really who you are. Well, let the game play out. If the Sixers keep finding ways to win these uglier ones, these dirty ones, the track record speaks. That's who they are. I'm a big track record guy. One quarter, not enough of a track record. The four quarters put together in totality, that tells me more. And if I'm watching this team consistently find and grind ways to win after a slow start in the first quarter, after another team ends up lighting the lamp, there's something to that if it keeps happening. I don't want them to go down. And if your argument and your rebuttal would be, well, this can't happen against better teams. I get that. I do. I don't know if the approach is the same. Game 68 of the regular season compared to game three of the second round. I value NBA regular season. I see things about the team. We get the knowledge of what they can do on who they can be. But there's another element in the postseason. So playing Portland, playing Washington, playing some of these teams, the Indiana Pacers, game 63, 64, 67. And the first quarter there compared to a first quarter at home, second round of the postseason, knowing what the storylines have been forever. I don't think the uh, the approach is the same. But to a degree, I'll still stand by that. If if you're in a playoff game and one team can't miss in the first quarter, I go, hey, there's 36 more minutes. There's no way they're going to knock down seven more threes that way. Like they're not going to shoot 100% from three the rest of the way. Keep going. Keep attacking. Keep getting your buckets. Let's stay in striking distance. And then when the fourth quarter happens... And it ends up being a six-point game when you were once down 17. There's eight minutes to go. Now it's time. Time to deliver. So, I don't know. That's how I see it.
Chris from Mass text into the text board. All the MVP talk that's happening right now is necessary to change the narrative. It's simple. If Embiid plays like this the rest of the way, I think he plays his way to MVP. He needs these moments to overcome the joke, uh, the Joker triple double narrative. He's amazing regardless, and I'm really liking this team's chances. Something's different, even with Doc. <laughs> <laughs> Doc was brought up for the first time. You know what I'm going to say about the Doc comment? And we'll end on this thought. You know why Doc looks better? Because in being in James Harden, you win in this league with superstars. That's why the head coach looks different. Why does Joe Missoula have the Boston Celtics where they're at? Because Jason Tatum. And that doesn't mean he doesn't do anything. Doc does have a role in this. The reason why something's different, as Chris from Masters texted in, something's different, he says. I like this team's chances. I'm really liking this team's chances. Let me make sure I fix that. I'm really liking this team's chances. Something's different, even with Doc. Superstars. That's how this league goes. Superstars. Thank you guys all so much for kicking it with me. You're the best. I love you. If you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe. Appreciate it. Thank you guys. Catch you on the next one.